Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel CCM Drummer. My name is Matthew Jackson and I'm continuing my series of critique and observation of the Jesus Music movie and the segment that you're watching right now is part four. In part one I gave a general review and also talked about my brief encounter with Amy Grant. In part two I took the editor's of the movie, that would be Andrew and John Irwin to task for injecting race into the, uh, to the, to the narrative of the history of CCM and Jesus music and uh, how they took a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. out of context. And I also addressed the notion uh, put forth by John J. Thompson that CCM somehow took credit for the song Stomp by Kirk Franklin. So I addressed that in part two. In part three, I addressed uh, the concept of integration and segregation as it relates to CCM music. So if you haven't seen those episodes, I encourage you to go and watch those episodes as well after you finish this part, part four. Before I get into part four though, let me remind you guys, uh, please feel free to comment, like, subscribe, share, you know the you know the drill. And again, uh, dissenting comments or dislikes are welcome just as much as a comments and agreement and likes are. Uh, either way, that helps grow my channel. So let me get started. Now in this segment, uh, in, in subsequent segments, uh, I wanna respond to Mandisa, Lecrae, Michael Tate, and Kirk Franklin. Now, I don't think I'm going to be able to respond to all four of these guys in this one 15-minute episode, but I think I'll probably be able to do uh, Mendisa and Lecrae, but we'll have to wait and see on Michael Tate and uh, Kirk Franklin, and if I can't cover them in this episode, we'll push that over to the next one. So here we go, Mendisa. Mandisa was an artist, a CCM artist, that was featured in the movie. She had some interview time. And this is uh, one of the sound bites that she had made in the movie. Quote, the tension that I felt, that I often, right, that I felt often is I grew up hearing, why are you talking like a white girl? I'm not. That's how I was raised. Then I hear things like, well, she's too gospel or it's too black. And gosh, when you hear that as a black woman, you just start to think that I'm not enough or I'm not good enough, close quote. Okay, now, Mandisa, if you're watching this, let me talk to you directly here. First of all, what the what the uh, people said, you know, about you talking like a white girl and you're too gospel or it's too black, those are racial remarks. They are racial, but they're not racist. There's a difference between making a racial remark and a racist remark. So these were not racist remarks. And certainly, I wouldn't claim to be a victim of racism because of what was said here. Now, having said that, as I look at your sheet here, you produced a total of six albums. Uh, of those six albums, 14 of those songs, 14 songs on those six albums hit the CCM charts that were hits, okay? Pretty good. Uh, you won two Grammy Awards and were nominated for another four Grammy Awards. You were nominated for three uh, Billboard Music Awards, and you were nominated for six Dove Awards. So I think this is a testimony. This is a story of victory. Instead of playing the victim here, this is a this is a story of how you overcome. Okay, I mean, uh, I would say that that your accomplishments, what you've accomplished thus far, is pretty good for someone who's supposedly too gospel or too black. 
there are a lot of white CCM artists that don't have what you have. They don't even have two Grammys or four Grammy nominations or six Double Award nominations or three Billboard nominations, Billboard Award nominations. I mean, I'd say you accomplished a lot and you overcame. Uh, so this is a story of victory. This is a testimony. Every artist has their naysayers when they start their careers. There are too much of this or not enough of that, okay? Even Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, Stephen Curtis Chapman, Sandy Patty, they all, when they began their careers, they all had their naysayers saying, there are not enough of this or too much of that. I have heard the same thing uh, for me as a drummer, that I'm not enough of this or too much of that. I don't let those people stop me. And the people who actually said that it's that you're too gospel or it's too black, where are they? What have they done? How many CCM albums have they produced? How many of their songs made the charts? How many Grammys have they been have they won or been nominated for? So who cares what those pinheads said? So yeah, I would take this. Is a, is a testimony and, you know, tell people how you overcame the odds. And you can do anything you want to do if you put your mind to it. Okay, that's enough for Memphisa. Let me talk about Lecrae. Now, I got I to gotta be honest and confess, I didn't know who Mandisa or Lecrae was until I saw this movie. And then I had to go back and do some research on these guys and find out what their hit songs were and listen to some of their songs. And, and, and I did that with Lecrae, by the way. Now, this is what Lecrae said in the movie. Then you go to CCM, and it's like you don't sing, you don't have a guitar, you're a black dude, so you are also a minority, so you don't quite fit in there. You are not going to hip hop. You do rap. You do got visible tattoos. You are talking about God, faith, and love. Where do I belong? I, ha I don't have a home. I'm just in exile. End of quote. Okay. Now, another quote he made is uh, this is the second quote. If the church truly believes that we're one body, then the church will tear down those racial divides, end of quote. So I'll, I'll address the second quote later, but let me get to the first quote. Um, Lecrae, if you're listening by any chance, uh, I did go in preparation for this video. I did actually go on YouTube and try to listen to uh, maybe four or five of your songs to get a random sampling of what your work is like. And one thing I observed is that your work is different than the hip hop rap that I that I'm used to hearing that I've heard before. Okay, now you say you don't have a home and you're just in exile because you're you're the kind of artist that has your own unique style and presentation, and it's really hard to pigeonhole you into a specific genre. Now, my advice to you would be the same as is the advice that I gave to Mandisa, and that is. I would embrace this fact that you can't be pigeonholed into a genre. That's what makes you unique. That's a good thing, okay? We live in a day and age now where all the artists are trying to emulate the other artists and everybody's trying to sound like everybody else. And nobody really has a distinctive mark that their own, like we did back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, okay? So... In a way, this is a good thing that, that you can't be pigeonholed and, and you know, because it, it makes you stand out with distinction. And I was looking at your sheet here. You have, you're involved in five hit CCM songs. Uh, uh, of course, one of them was with Mike's Chair. Um, and then uh, Hillsong featured you. Uh, in one song, that, that that became a hit. And then you have uh, a hit song called Messengers, 
where you featured King and Country, and then uh, and then uh, you have the song uh, Give In, where you feature Crystal Nicole. You've won three BET awards, were nominated for two BET awards. You got three BET award hip hop nominations. You won one Billboard award, were nominated for another three. You won nine Dub Awards. Dude, that is awesome. And you were nominated for another 26 Dub Awards. So that's uh, uh, Grammy Awards. You've won two Grammys and were nominated for six. Won three Stellar Awards, were nominated for three. And you won four Soul Train Music Awards and were nominated for one. Dude, off of 11 albums that you did. This is pretty good for a guy that doesn't have a home and it's in exile, I would say. I would say you're doing very well here. That's that's nothing to sneeze at. So, yeah, embrace the fact that you're different and can't be pigeonholed to a, a genre. Let that work to your advantage. Now, let me talk about your second quote. The church, If the church truly believes that we are one body, the church will tear down those racial divides. Those racial divides. Okay, now we have racial divides in the church. Okay, what do these racial divides look like exactly? Okay, are there any predominantly white churches that are not allowing black people to come to their church? Are there any black churches that are not allowing white people to come to their church? When you say racial divides, what it is, what are you talking about? And how would the church go about tearing down these racial divides? And when you say the church, I guess you're talking about the churches here in America, right? Okay. Are we including the Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and mainline Protestants in, these, in, these, uh, in, in this conversation here? When you say the church, are we just talking about the evangelical churches that's supposed to tear down these racial divides? Uh, what about the black churches? Are they expected to play a part in tearing down racial divides also? Or is it just the white churches that are supposed to be tearing down those racial divides? So, you know, I'd like a little more clarity in context uh, and definition as to what you mean by uh, the church will tear down those racial divides. Tell me what these racial divides look like and how we're supposed to tear them down. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, uh, let me get to Michael Tate. Now, Michael Tate's quote, basically, he told a story about how he was traveling through Tennessee, and he stopped in a small podunk town called Tracy's, uh, Tennessee, and he stopped, actually, it was at a podunk store in Tracy, Tennessee. And uh, how the clerk, when he was going to the counter to check out and buy his stuff, and I assume he was paying for his gas or maybe he paid at the pump, I don't know. But uh, anyway, whatever products he bought from that store, as he was buying the products, the clerk says, well, is this all for you, boy? Is this all you want, boy? And, uh, and, he, and he says, yeah, that's it. And he goes, man, it's getting dark out there. You better uh, get out of here. Someone going to out there might uh, come hang you after dark, okay? So the clerk suggested that Michael Tate might be hanged after dark, okay? Now, this took place in the year of 2000, okay? And now, now talk about racist remarks. This would be an example of a racist remark. This was very racist, okay? Very despicable, very ungrateful. And it's the sort of thing that should not have happened, should not have happened in, in the 21st century, but it shouldn't happen in any century, okay? So, and he, then he talks about after that, after how, he talks about how he felt after that, how he felt less than, how he felt like he got hit by a truck full of steel, something like that. And that's understandable. I don't criticize him for the way he felt after that guy said those things that, he, that they're going to hang him after dark. 
okay? So I will continue with the Michael Tate quote and the Michael Tate um, part of this in part five, because my 15 minutes are up. So yeah, I like to keep my, my, my videos short, okay? So anyway, we'll continue with Michael Tate and my comments on, on his encounter with that goofy redneck, okay? Anyway, thank you for watching. And again, please feel free to subscribe, like, share, and comment, and check out some of my drum covers that I did. Thank you and God bless.